1966 was an important year in world history. Paul Van Doren founded the Van Shoe Company, which would one day nearly ruin the name Daniel. It's a small world opened at Disney, creating animatronic nightmares for generations of kids. And most importantly, Gene Roddenberry created a little sci-fi show called Star Trek, which has since spawned a sprawling mythology, generating countless films, TV series, novels, video games, and even a weird marshmallow dispenser. I don't know why they did that. With any great franchise that has a die-hard fan base comes a series of increasingly crazy fan theories. So to help you go boldly where no one should have probably gone before, on today's episode of The Dan Cave, we're gonna talk about some of the weird weirdest Star Trek fan theories ever made. Spock is related to Sherlock Holmes. In 1991, Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country, Mr. Spock, as played by the late great Leonard Nimoy, uttered the phrase, when you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. While the phrase sounds like something the highly logical Vulcan might say himself, it's actually a quote from Sherlock Holmes in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Sign of the Four. Now, Spock explains that it's something an ancestor of his used to say. So, does that mean that Sherlock Holmes was a secret Vulcan detective hiding out on Earth who made it with a human woman, eventually producing Spock? Well, not quite. I mean, it's been established in the Star Trek universe that Sherlock is a fictional character. But maybe Spock is a Conan Doyle space baby. And if not, there's, there's always fan fiction. I mean, you could be writing it right now. I can't see you. What are you doing? What are you writing? Kirk is a whale murderer. What happens when a rogue space probe that only answers to a humpback whale song threatens to destroy Earth in the future? Well, easy. You get a whale. Duh. A what? Wait, really? All the whales in the future are extinct? Well, then, then you just go back to the past, to like 1986, and you steal two whales and a marine biologist too. And that's exactly what James T. Kirk did in Star Trek IV The Voyage Home. Except there's one problem. By removing the whales and an expert leading conservation efforts for humpback whales in a time when humpback populations were rapidly dwindling, Kirk created a predestination paradox, thereby dooming these poor undersea bastards to extinction in the first place. You know, that old chestnut. That old time traveling, whale murdering, butterfly affecting chestnut. And I think I speak for all of us when I say, double dumbass on you. Khan obliterated China and India. When Star Trek the original series first premiered, it was unlike anything else on TV, partially due to its diverse cast of characters. Yet in spite of this diversity, there seem to be remarkably few characters of Chinese and Indian descent. So where did those billions of people go? Well, according to some fans, Khan slaughtered many of them during the eugenics wars, and then he went full on Gandhi in Civilization IV and nuked them out of existence in World War III. And before you start swearing off Brindlesnarf Clamberpatch's perfect cheekbones, remember, it was Ricardo Montalban who did it. Ricardo Montalban who did it. Montalban! Data is a big fat phony. Now, one of the running conceits in Star Trek The Next Generation is that Data, the Enterprise's resident android, doesn't understand human customs or expressions. But Data's knowledge base is vaster than anyone else's on the ship. I mean, he's a freaking android. He can access reams of data about all of human history. So why wouldn't some of humanity's idiosyncrasies be included in there? Well, the idea behind this theory is that Data is playing us simple humans like the dumb meat violins that we really are, lulling us into a false sense of security so that he can gain our trust and our friendship and our empathy so that he can climb the ranks of Starfleet and seize control of the galaxy. After all, he's an android. He's not exactly gonna die of old age. I mean, that's plenty of time for this mechanical Machiavelli to puppet master his way to power and rule the galaxy with an iron fist or whatever data's made of. Robo flesh? I don't know, you tell me. Now guys, these are just a few of the absolutely bonkers Star Trek fan theories floating around out there. But tell me, what are your favorites? Let me know in the comments below and give me a highly illogical a thumbs up while you're there. And be sure to like and subscribe so you guys don't miss next week's show when we talk about the story of a tabby cat and a pug that leave their Japanese farm home only to wind up on death row in the green Milo and Otis. Until next time, keep on digging. Let's open up the old mailbag, shall we? At James Viscardi asks, Zubat or Diglett? Dude, seriously? Zubats are flying trash. Diglett till I die, bro. At Sassimus Maximus asks, what are the odds of seeing a Dread sequel? Funny you should ask, I actually just interviewed Carl Urban about this recently, and he said there's unfortunately nothing on the horizon. So 
Sadly, it's highly unlikely. I mean, there's no money there for it. There's no real demand there for it other than extremely vocal fans like us. And I mean, I would kill for a sequel, but don't get your hopes up. At Cam Hollage asks, least favorite cinematic Avenger, go! All right, well, I will. I'm gonna go with Quicksilver because the X-Men version is way more fun, first of all, and the Marvel version, uh, they killed him off too quickly just for the sake of like pulling at our heartstrings. It felt a little cheap, to be honest. Didn't really feel that earned. But tell me, who is your least favorite cinematic Avenger and why? Let me know in the comments below and I'll see you guys next time.